Most ball for touch for a long time. Touch club. Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Lomachenko versus Lopez is now targeted for October 3rd, says Aaron. Scheduling and rescheduling is the name of the game as Top Rank is working on its schedule for the rest of the year, which includes a date change for the much-anticipated lightweight title unification between Vasil Lomachenko and Teofimo Lopez Jr. Lomachenko Lopez, which was first penciled in for May 30th at Madison Square Garden in New York, but forced to move to September 19th at a site to be determined due to the coronavirus virus pandemic is moving again. Loma Lopez, we had scheduled it for September 19th as the working date, but now it will probably go on pay-per-view, and that means the working date now is October 3rd. Aram said of a fight he hopes to hold in Las Vegas, although whether there will be spectators allowed to attend is undetermined. Right now, with the coronavirus spike going on in Nevada, we couldn't schedule it even with limited spectators. Hopefully, and we have some time, we're looking to do that fight for 2,000 or maybe 2,500 people. This recent news leaves one to wonder if this latest postponement of what is Lomachenko versus Lopez helps or hurts the plight of Teofimo Lopez. Teofimo Lopez, who for all accounts is busting at the seams. He's ready to move up. In the past, a sense of urgency was expressed by Teofimo Lopez, his people, that they wanted to have that fight sooner than later. I didn't want to wait. And I have no doubts that Teofimo's struggles to make the weight, 135 pounds, have a lot to do with it. Now, on one end, this recent postponement could hurt Teofimo Lopez because for a guy who is rapidly outgrowing the lightweight division, if it takes longer to make the fight, it'll be that much harder for Teofimo to make the weight. That's one way to look at it. Yet another way to look at it is that, you know what, this recent postponement might buy Teofimo even more time to make the weight, make the weight comfortably, at least more comfortably than there were a time constraint if the fight date itself were right around the corner. It all depends on how you look at it. This latest postponement could be yet another hindrance for Teofimo Lopez or... It could be a blessing in disguise. I think ultimately that's going to fall on what Teofimo does with the time. There are other factors that need to be addressed, aside from whether or not Teofimo will make the weight comfortably. You know, Teofimo, this guy's got, what, 15 professional fights, 15 professional wins. But out of all those professional fights he's had so far, he's only ever gone the distance once. He's only ever fought for 12 rounds against Masayoshi Nakatani. Oh. It's essentially saying that Teofimo Lopez is a guy who's really not accustomed to going into those championship rounds, those deep waters where you've got to dig deep in order to pull out the victory. And Teofimo Lopez, essentially what you're talking about is a guy whose fights, more often than not, don't make it past the midway point. What that communicates is that whether this guy can make the weight comfortably or not. Regardless of that, whether he can or he can't, the longer this fight wears on, the more it favors Basil Lomachenko. So it behooves Teofimo Lopez to wrap this thing up and wrap this thing up early. The question is, can he? This ain't Richard Comey. This isn't a power puncher who often hyperextends, commits to his punches, and thereby creates an opening for the other fighter, the other fighter being Teofimo Lopez. Sil Lomachenko's punches, as opposed to Richard Comey's, 
are a lot shorter, thereby a lot harder to counter. And harder to read. With what can only be interpreted as decoy punches. They'll touch a couple of times, not very many, if any, bad intentions on the shots, and then mix in a power shot, and you won't know when he's going to do it. That's what makes him such a difficult guy to read. A couple of light touches upstairs, and then out of nowhere comes a body shot. I think the best analogy for the difference between a Richard Comey and a Vasil Lomachenko is that Richard Comey, eh, he's more of a fastball guy, whereas Lomachenko, he'll throw that curveball. I think it's safe to say that getting an early knockout on a guy like Vasil Lomachenko, a guy so skillful yet so nuanced, could prove a lot more difficult than it was for Teofimo to get that knockout over Richard Comey, as this is no fastball pitcher. It's a curveball kind of guy, kind of guy that makes you look one way to get you from another. We don't know any certainty how Teofimo Lopez will hold up as this fight wears on against this kind of an opponent. As I reiterate, Teofimo Lopez has only gone the distance once, just once. Nakatani. In a fight where he didn't look his best, I might add. What's he gonna have left? Assuming he doesn't get an early knockout, and you're past the midway point of the match, the last leg of it rolls around, that last quarter, that ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th round. How's his defense going to be holding up? Teofimo's an orthodox fighter who likes to use a shell defense to offset the other man's aggression. Rolling punches off the shoulder, but Vasil Lomachenko's a southpaw. For Vasil Lomachenko, being a southpaw, leading with his right, that creates an area of opportunity to where Vasil Lomachenko doesn't necessarily have to touch Teofimo with his jab. He can feint with it and set up a straight left hand, fire it right down the pipe. Oh. Up top, boy. Downstairs, hit him in the basement, take the air out of the guy, thereby hampering what would otherwise be Teofimo's explosiveness. If Teofimo is any kind of puncher, he's an explosive puncher, fights in bursts. It's not a sustained attack that you get from Teofimo, not a sustained attack like what you see from a pressure guy, a guy like a, uh, a Miguel Burchell. Teofimo's not a volume puncher. Teofimo looks to land a single shot, get the guy hurt, then start pouring it on. But he's not a volume guy. Not till he can land that single shot to get the guy height and then start pouring it on. This creates an environment to where Teofimo's looking for that avenue of opportunity, looking to land that single shot, and whilst he's doing this, he's befuddled by Loma's feints, his movements, his angles, his decoy punches, his pivots. Could see a situation to where, round by round, Vasil Lomachenko strategically decides to go downstairs on Teofimo Lopez with singles to gradually take the air, take the fight out of that guy. That guy who would otherwise be an explosive puncher. But he's being worn down. You want to think about that? So Lomachenko strategically does this. He goes downstairs on Teofimo Lopez, round by round. Not being overzealous with his speed or his combinations, just a body shot here, another well-placed body shot there. Round after round. Teofimo Lopez, who's not even accustomed to going past the midway point of a boxing match. This creates an environment to where Teofimo might have looked sharp in the early goings of the match, but he might start taking punishment after the half. Teofimo, who... Not accustomed to going the distance, and lest we forget, is busting at the seams, is struggling to make this weight. Lomachenko can get him late. It's for this reason that Teofimo's best bet to win this match is to wrap it up and wrap it up early, because the longer this fight goes on, the more it favors Vasil Lomachenko, who's gone the distance more times than Teofimo has. That way he's got more professional and more amateur experience than Teofimo. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Teofimo's best bet in this match really does boil down to a puncher's chance. As down the stretch, I can't trust him, his wherewithal, to hold up. This is a big stage, the biggest stage that Teofimo has ever fought in. And this is coming at a time where he's struggling to make the weight. I mean, that's the wild card. That's, that's the variable, as it were, that maybe the postponement allows Teofimo more time to make the weight and make the weight comfortably, or maybe it takes too goddamn long, and, you know, he's struggling, it shows up in his performance. Any way you slice it, whatever effect this postponement does or doesn't have on Teofimo, it behooves him to wrap this thing up and wrap this thing up early, as it's his best chance to win this fight. Moving on. 
In heavyweight news, Joseph Parker versus Junior Fa. Teams continue heated talks to finalize a deal. The negotiations have resumed for a heavyweight grudge match between Joseph Parker and Junior Fa. Parker's handlers have tried several times to make the Fa fight happen, but they never get close to agreeing on the financial aspects of the deal. Parker and Fa fought four times in the amateurs, with each man walking away with two wins. Parker's manager, David Higgins, explains that they offered Fa a big purse and have yet to hear a response. Two days ago, we offered Fa more than 500,000 New Zealand dollars to fight Joseph Parker. That's ten times the biggest fight he's ever had, the second biggest fight in the history of New Zealand. The only bigger purse has been when Parker fought Andy Ruiz Jr. and won the world title. Junior Fa was offered the second biggest purse ever. Ever. To fight the guy he had been calling out for two years, we can't get a response. The only explanation is, Junior Fa is using Joseph Parker to build his name, and then he's offered $500,000, enough to buy a house, and he runs, Higgins told Sky Sports. But Fa's promoter, Lou DiBella, says the offer is not as great as Higgins makes it out to be. That's simply not true. I don't believe in negotiating through the press. That's not how it's done, when you really want to make the fight. The guaranteed money in the offer was $200,000 dollars US. I found the offer, guarantee, and upside to be totally unacceptable for one of the biggest fights in New Zealand boxing's history. I didn't accept it. I will be discussing it further with Junior's team shortly, DeBella said. Under Higgins' offer, the fight would need to do huge business for the Foss side to see $500,000 in New Zealand between us. They can't assert how big the fight is and act like Junior is an insignificant participant. This is a far more interesting proposition for Joseph Parker than any of the guys that he's been keeping busy with. You know, Alex Lapai, Shondell Winters. This is essentially a grudge match between two guys who've got a lot of history. So as far as the fighters are concerned, having locked horns in the amateurs as many times as they have, I don't necessarily think Parker is scared of Fa or Fa is scared of Parker. But it's the way that the situation is being handled, how it's being treated, that speaks to how the managers, those guys, the fighters, handlers, their promoters, that's what speaks to how they view the fight. You've got to understand that Junior Fa isn't so much as a blip on the radar on the world stage of heavyweight boxing. Junior Fa might look like the younger guy, but he's actually two years older than Joseph Parker. Joseph's 28, whereas Junior's 30. 30. And what notoriable wins has Junior Fa amassed so far? He has yet to fight the likes of a Carlos de a Derek Chisora, for Christ's sake, a Dave Allen. Yeah. Try and understand that while Junior Fa might have his O intact, a good part of the reason that might be is he hasn't stepped up in competition yet. Oh. So you want to be a hardliner. You want to play hardball. You want to haggle. But you have to be in a position to do so. And I don't think that Junior Fa is there. I just don't. If he were to walk away from this grudge match with his old amateur rival, Joseph Parker, what would he be walking away from this to do what? when he hasn't done anything yet. You know, this ain't a title fight. It's not. Junior Fa is not, nor has he ever been, a world champion or an interim champion. Any kind. He hasn't. How much are you supposed to pay what is an unbeaten prospect level fighter? Because that's what he is until he steps up in competition. In this situation. What are you supposed to pay this guy? What are you supposed to guarantee this guy? All things considered, I think a $200,000 guarantee with an upside is a generous offer for Junior Fa because what are his alternatives? You pass on this to do what? Fight more unheralded guys like Devin Vargas and Dominic Gwynn? You think that's going to get you somewhere? What'd you get paid to fight those guys? I don't know that Junior Fa is necessarily apprehensive given how much history he has with Joseph. It doesn't look like the kind of situation to me to where the fighter himself is the one who's apprehensive so much as his handlers, namely Lou DiBella. Lou DiBella's looking at $200,000 from a United States lens. That's how he's looking at it. Because in the United States for an unbeaten heavyweight prospect, maybe to Lou, that seems like small potatoes. Maybe it does. But this fight ain't going down in the United States, is it? No, it's going down in New Zealand. That is a significantly smaller market, a significantly smaller boxing scene than what you see here stateside. So, maybe in New Zealand, 200 thou makes sense. But for Lou, who's sitting here stateside, he's thinking to himself, for sending my guy out there for $200,000, I might as well not send him out there at all. Oh. It's just that if you don't, 
What do you have lined up for him? If you're willing to walk away from this situation, what's the alternative? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about the division that Junior Fah's in. Never mind the Anthony Joshua's, Tyson Fiori's, Andy Ruiz's, and Deontay Wilder's of the heavyweight division. Never mind those guys. You've got the Arslanbek Mahmadovs, the Abdi Daftaevs, the Michael Hunters and Jared Andersons to worry about. These are guys that are in a similar position Up and comers. to Junior Fa. You have the Agit Kabayels, the Tony Yokas to worry about. Up and comers. These guys could beat Junior just as easily as Joseph Parker could. But at least with Joseph Parker, it's a bigger event Domestically. than losing one of those guys. Because I'll tell you something. You're not in line right now for any of the big dogs. You're not in line for Wilder, a Tyson Fury, a Anthony Joshua. Hell, you're not in line for a cool Brad Pulev. None of them. You're not on those guys' radar. You're not on the radar of an Andy Ruiz or a Luis Ortiz, a Dillian White, an Alexander Povetkin. I mean, you're not on any of these guys' radar. But en route to getting there, a guy like Junior Fa, he could lose. And that loss might set him back even more than it would if he lost to Joseph Parker. Think about it. Who says that Junior Fa's earnings for lock and horns with Joseph Parker have to be limited to just this one fight? Who says you can't get two fights? out of this thing. You might not be aware of this, but in the land down under, Australia, New Zealand sniper, it just so happens that Anthony Mundine and Danny Green, those two guys, domestic level guys, at that time, they locked horns two times. And in their second fight, both those guys made a nice chunk of change, more than you might think, for what very much was a domestic level fight. So I look at that situation, and I look at this situation, and I tell myself that why can't Parker versus Fa be billed as a two-fight engagement. Maybe even a three-fight engagement. If the fight yields a pleasing aesthetic, there's no reason you can't stage a second one or a third one. You give the boxing scene down there in New Zealand a shot in the arm with a grudge match between two guys who've got a lot of history. Junior hasn't established himself as a world-level guy yet, but he can do that here in victory or defeat, depending on how he performs, against Joseph Parker. I mean, that's essentially the situation between Tim Zhu and Jeff Horn. If fucking fight finally comes off. I don't think that Junior Fah's handlers, Lou DiBella, are looking at this fight in the proper scope. It doesn't have to be a one-off. You can turn this into a two to three fight engagement and make the most of the situation given the circumstances. Oh. Both of these guys, they're local guys. They've got a score to settle. And it's a long-standing feud between them. So before they go turning their nose up at this money, this Parker fight, what they should be asking themselves is, what's the alternative? You walk away from this, you're walking away from this to do what exactly? Potentially lose to someone else? That, before you go driving a hard bargain and haggling, are you really even in a position to do that? 